apologies for this. This is literally the first thing I've ever run in this. Um, I've done lots of remos, uh, so the platform's really new. Um, but I just want to um, quickly welcome you to the fourth improved camp, or the fifth, or the sixth, depending on whether you come to the the prequels. If we're going to uh, adopt the um, sort of uh, Star Wars approach, so um, improved camps for people uh, who are passionate about public service excellence and want to hear some really interesting speakers. Um, I'm going to come on to Joe in a second. Um, and I suppose I started it because I thought there was a gap, really, uh, in what was going on. Bored of all these bloody um, events that are salesy and stuff like that. And I know people want to hear interesting speakers talk about interesting topics. So useful content. Um, we're open to everyone, whether you're public sector, private sector. If you're looking at improving public services, that's that's who we're for. Um, very much a big focus on short sessions, Q&A, and then going into networking and making some connections, talking to people, hence why we're we're trying out this at the moment, this air meet, and um, looking to connect people across sectors and do some good work overall, you know, that's the aim, and hopefully solve some problems um, along the way. So a couple of things to just say, uh, we are trying air meet today, um, it's different to Remo, um, after the session, if you go to the lounge, jump on a table, you can talk to people. The tables will expand to the size of eight. There's speed network in there as well. Um, there's other sort of features. Have a look around. There's there's like an arena area that's got our old sessions on and stuff like that. Um, and we will be setting up a circle.so community. So a bit like Slack but more about, you know, real conversation and solving problems and a bit more asynchronous than Slack is how they describe it. But have a look at Circle, it's really good. I'll be there next week and I'll send some links in the chat. So um, that's it. I'm not going to go on any more about what we are. I'm going to introduce Joe. And as I was saying, two seconds before to Joe, and I think I put in a tweet today, I think the very epitome of why I wanted to start uh, Improve Camp is this kind of experience, which is Joe came along to a session two weeks ago and talked about stuff and had some amazing stories to tell and said, yeah, I, I could do a session. And here we are two weeks later. So um, I'm just going to go down Joe's speaker bio and this doesn't define him at all, but Joe McDonald consultant psychiatrist, uh, former national clinical lead for IT, chief uh, clinical information officer at England's largest mental health trust, former director of Connected Health Cities, North East North Cumbria, and director of the Great North Care Project, um, a successful record sharing project for 3.6 million citizens, visiting professor of health informatics, practice at Newcastle University, England, and someone who I wish I had like a fraction of those things to put on my CV. But Joe, I'm, I'm going to stop now, mate, and I'm going to hand over to you. And I will try and uh, disappear from the stage as best I can. Um, but if you want to introduce your topic, I know none of that, it, you know, sort of defines anything, but over to you, mate. Thank you. Okay, can can people see my slides? I think so. I I can see them, mate. Um, right. Okay, anyone good. In the chat? We'll anyway, go. carry on, mate. And yeah, all good, mate. Carry on. All right, grand. Uh, so, fifteen years of my life in fifteen minutes. So that's who I am. Um, you've heard a little bit about what I've been up to. Uh, National Clinic Lead for IT during the disastrous national programme uh, and then happily had some more success with uh, a regional programme called the Great North Care Record, uh, an information sharing project for 3.6 million citizens that's used about a quarter of a million times every month nowadays. 
So what does failure look like? What does a disaster look like? How does a disaster start? Well, the national program had all the mar all the makings of a disaster from the from the outset. So it was a top down project, allegedly born over conversation between Bill Gates and Tony Blair uh, in Number Ten Downing Street, and the brief was as vague as let's electronify the NHS. So no clinical demand, no actual problem to solve, but just the grand political vanity project um, to get the NHS digital. Milton Freeman, um, the economist says there are four ways to spend your money, your own money on yourself, you're buying a winter coat, so you buy yourself a nice uh, cashmere coat from a very good shop, uh, and you make sure you don't overpay. Your own money on somebody else, you're buying a, a birthday present for somebody, you might buy them a coat, might not be cashmere, but again, you won't get fleeced. Somebody else's money on yourself, I'll have the Lafitte 55 uh, and uh, the Wagyu beef, please. Uh, and somebody else's money on somebody else. This is the worst way to spend money, according to Milton Friedman. Uh, and that was what we did in the National Programme for IT. We spent a great deal of taxpayers' money on somebody else who wasn't uh, involved in making any of the decisions. Can you have too much money for a project? Yes, you can. Uh, so we have £12.7 billion pounds to spend on electronifying the NHS. Uh, and one of the early casualties is truth. In fact, when you put that much money on the table, uh, it will warp space time and it will do, um, it will produce very strange behaviours. It will make fat, um, middle-aged Geordie psychiatrists sexually irresistible to software salespeople. Um, and uh, a great deal uh, of money will, will warp um, minds, frankly. As a psychiatrist, I thought I knew a lot about people, but until the national program and I saw what money did to people, uh, I had a great deal more to learn. So obviously we decided to go big. We decided not to trial uh, electronifying the NHS anywhere. We decided we'd go massive. The only, the only organization bigger than the NHS is the Chinese Red Army, but I'm pretty sure they would try out anything uh, rather than just impose it on all 1.2 million staff. But we went big, really big, without any trials. We had a great many leaders, starting with Richard Granger, who was in charge at the outset, and he um, he, he famously described the project. Uh, he carved up the country into six areas. Uh, and we gave contracts to major system suppliers, uh, and he uh, he famously described the system suppliers, the, the people who are providing the software to the NHS, as like huskies uh, in a in a race to the South Pole. Uh, and if any of the dogs fell sick, he would shoot it and feed it to the others. Well, unfortunately, within a couple of years, we only had two huskies left, and the sled was still very heavy. Um, and we had a lot of organisational senior management churn. One of the things that we didn't get right was authority. Um, now, in order to make any big project go, you need to understand the work of 19th century sociologist Max Weber, who said that there are different kinds of authority. Structural authority, I'm your boss, so I can tell you what to do. Moral authority, I'm your priest, so I can tell you what to do. Financial authority, I'm paying the bill, so I can tell you what to do. Sapiential authority, the, from the Latin sapiens, meaning wisdom. So the authority that comes from special knowledge, doctor's orders, if you like, uh, and charismatic authority. I'm Donald Trump. I can whip up a crowd, get them to do my bidding and go and storm the Capitol, that kind of authority. In order to make a really big IT project go, though, you need to get them all lined up. And we didn't. The structural uh, authority within the NHS is very distributed and it's very difficult. And the minister doesn't understand this. So when he pulls a lever in Westminster, he expects to see something happen in Newcastle, and it just doesn't work like that. So we didn't get all those authorities lined up. Uh, we hoarded all the financial authority in the centre. We didn't allow people near the ground who were going to be using systems to have any choice. Uh, and consequently, uh, those authorities were not lined up. This is a photograph. The young man on the right uh, is Charles Hesterman Mertz. He's the father of the national grid. And next to him is Lord Kelvin, so famous they named a, a measurement of temperature after him. And next to him is Thomas Westinghouse. They're all in they're all in uh, Wall's End in Newcastle around the turn of the last century, where uh, 
Charles Mert uh, had the first power station. And he realized that electricity would only ever be any good um, if we were all on 240 volts and 50 hertz. Uh, otherwise, your vacuum cleaner would work at Gateshead, but not in Newcastle. Um, unfortunately, in the National Programme for IT, we didn't have any agreed standards around uh, how we would share information, what information would be shared, what coding systems we would use. The other thing we did was that we ignored the concerns of the public, uh, and the public were rightly concerned about uh, their very personal information being shared electronically. Organisations like Big Brother Watch, which the National Programme dismissed as tinfoil hat wearers, but actually they were canaries in the mine, telling us that there was a great deal that needed to be worked out about the morality and about the ethics of sharing information, none of which we'd really thought about at the time. Uh, and we came a cropper later on uh, in a scandal called Care.Data when people realised actually that their information was being sold off cheap. Uh, and when you lose trust in a, a records project, that's, that's the end of that project usually. Uh, this is Dr. Eastwood. He's an old age psychiatrist. He works in Sunderland uh, and he wasn't asked whether he wanted to get rid of his paper records uh, and move on to uh, digital health records. And consequently, there was a great deal of clinical resistance from various royal colleges, um, none of whom had been consulted beforehand. The project um, set off with a vague idea of electronifying uh, the whole of the NHS. Uh, but it ended up um, with a huge amount of scope creep. So everybody wanted their special tool, their special bit, and consequently the project um, became unwieldy and undoable. Um, I was actually flown out to uh, Chennai at one point to look at the problem child of uh, the national program, a program called Lorenzo. Lorenzo is a hugely ambitious project. It was going to look after all of the people in the north of England, half the country. It was going to do GP records. It was going to do uh, hospital records, community records, mental health records. Uh, and it was massively ambitious. When I got to Chennai uh, and saw the scale of the operation, we had 2,000 devs um, working on the project. And if you know Brooks Law, you know that the more devs you put on a self software project, the worse it's going to get, and we had got it completely overblown. Uh, when I write my book about this, it will be called the lift attendant's assistant, because even the lift attendant had an assistant at the software house. When I came back from Chennai, I uh, I thought, well, you know, I'm a medical director and a professor and all that. I'll tell people that this project is overblown, breaking Brooks law, and probably doomed. Uh, so I I wrote a report. Uh, handwritten report because I was told not to put it into electronic format and I thought well that'll be the end of that uh, and of course nothing happened I was really surprised uh, just to be completely ignored um, but I was fired um, uh, or let go um, uh, and I decided that it was time for me to try and um, learn something from the years I'd spent in the national program not getting anywhere fast and I came across Professor Morgan Anastat who preaches uh, the, the gospel of, you cultivate a successful IT project, you build modules that talk to each other. It comes from the bottom up usually. She studied all the IT projects in the world and she drew this analogy that actually it's more like gardening than it is uh, you know, architecture and you have to grow things. There's a terrific video by her on YouTube. If you Google Margaret Anastat or if these slides are shared, follow that link. Uh, and um, it changed my life and my whole approach to electronic patient records and their development. So I thought I'd have another go, but this time maybe in a region where I knew everybody uh, and we could do something uh, on a cultivational basis and grow something. Uh, and uh, rather than try and architect the whole thing from, um, from Westminster, we would just try and make a little difference in one part of the country and maybe save a few quid on stamps and travel and repetition of tests by sharing information across the region. So we got a, we got a little money out of George Osborne uh, and we decided that we'd build this thing called the Great North Care Record uh, to share information uh, at the point of care 
to make life uh, better for patients and to make it safer uh, to get care. And we decided to come up with some branding and a clear vision about what it was we were going to do. And in order to get the message across to the public, we kept it simple, best place in the world to get care and the best place in the world to do research with the twin ambitions, which we thought we could convince the people of the Northeast to help us with. And we did. So, uh, you know, in fairly short order, we got 3.6 million citizens records shared. Uh, all of our, 100% of our general practices joined in. Um, uh, all of our local hospital services joined in and now uh, our mental health trusts are in uh, and um, the local authorities are also joining. But we think the size is just about right for this sort of project, 3.6 million citizens. Um, we had many different systems in place. All of these systems were in the Northeast and in an ideal world with, with a ton of money, you'd rip it all out and put a single system in and you wouldn't have to worry about interop. But that ideal world doesn't exist. We were never going to have enough money to take them out. So we had to find a way to join them up. We worked very hard at getting the clinical engagement right. What do the clinicians want? What, what do they need? And we worked very hard at engaging with our citizens to make sure that they were on board and that we didn't go over anybody's information sharing creepy line. This is what we call the wall of love. Down the side are the names of organizations. Along the top are and the names of roles in those organizations and the purple bits are actual people. Every one of these people had to be got to, talked to and learn to love the Great North Care Record to make it go. Uh, and uh, it's quite a matter I always thought these projects were about technology. This project wasn't really about technology. It was about collaboration, about getting a, a group of people to all move in the same direction at the same time. And every one of those had to move. So you've got your CIOs, CCIOs, chief execs, finance director, director of nursing, information governance leads, etc., all pulling in the same direction. Big team. Um, one of the principles behind our success was we borrowed from people who've done things well. We borrowed the information sharing gateway from Cumbria, and it allows you to do information sharing agreements at a massive scale and pace so that we're able to sign up everybody in the region, all the organizations in just a matter of weeks. It's as simple as getting a username and a password, and you click all the radio buttons of the organizations that you want to share your information with, and then you have your information sharing solved. Brilliant by the people of Cumbria. We borrowed it shamelessly, and we now help them fund it a little bit as well. We rolled out a very simple technology called MIG. We didn't innovate in any way, um, but what it did was it provided a subset of the GP record uh, into any place in the Northeast and North Cumbria, uh, and we rolled it out, uh, and people saw that it was good. Uh, and effectively, what it meant was the ambulance, the uh, the acute wards, the mental health wards, A and E could see your GP record in real time, um, uh, whenever they need to, and it just took off. It was an absolute game changer. The secondary care doctors couldn't believe how blind they'd been practicing for years, um, and we made it really easy to use. We made it one click from the uh, uh, the existing record system, so out of my mental health system, it's just one click to get into the GP record, uh, and it saves a great deal of time um, and a great deal of money. We're taking the Mark and Anisat modular approach, so we've now replaced MIG with a health information exchange so that it's not just the GP record now, all the hospital records can be viewed from all over the region and all the GP records, and the GPs can see it at the hospitals as well. Um, we have a, on the blocks, we've got another module, a patient engagement platform, which will allow the patients uh, to see their own information and to get and receive correspondence and appointments, saving our six million pounds a year, second class stamps bill as a region. And we also have a trusted research environment uh, on the drawing board. No money for that just yet, but it's coming. So what's the difference between triumph and disaster in a big health IT project? Well. Clinically led, we were clinically led throughout in Great North Care Record. Uh, we used simple existing technologies. It was led by the end users. It was cheap. Um, we kept the user and the developer in the same room rather than on different continents. We didn't migrate any data. Uh, that's a good way to burn through cash. Uh, we did it gradually uh, and we went for the very basic cake first. We didn't, we didn't try and add any whistles and bells. 
And that's it. 15 minutes or thereabouts. Hey, mate, I'm trying my best to come back, which I think I have. Um, thank you. That, that, that was brilliant. So um, the, the power of these sessions is more in the questions than um, the, uh, well, no, the presentation and the Q&A afterwards. Sorry, mate. I, I mean, <laughs> you did, Not you, taking Andy. <laughs> that's okay mate you know fair enough i uh, thank you very much for giving up your friday afternoon so i can insult you mate that's, that's um and if i'm on the insult mate i will just say you didn't you didn't point out your headset which you know is a wonderful on the fix gaffer tape uh, sort of thing um so uh just to uh, say to people if you could um if you've got any questions for Joe, which I'm sure people must have, um, please do raise your hand. It should be towards the bottom of the screen, and then I can invite you up. Um, also, please, if you don't want to come up, just uh, whack a question in the Q&A tab, um, which is in the session area Q&A. Um, we'll also look at the uh um yeah the text as well um i'm just gonna pull someone up because um i think we need some questions so uh who who who's gonna come on someone someone raise your hand or give me some questions so um from me joe um what, what do you reckon the, the future learning is for people to apply that same thinking? How do we, uh, are you saying small, I, I suppose I, I'd agree with everything you said, except maybe existing software for the smaller one, because I wouldn't always say existing software, but I would say kind of good software, you know what I mean? Because sometimes existing can be a bit legacy. Um, but yeah, I, I I I appreciate that. I mean, I I think the the issue that that we having spent a couple of years working on, you know, a, a piece of software which was so ambitious that it was never ever going to get there. You know, it was it was never going to get there. You're throwing two thousand devs at it, um, and it, that's just making it worse. To be honest, because you're just bringing in sort of um yeah well you just can't get that many people around the screen to be honest uh and, and it, it the the idea that i would do another big project um and, and do something useful what i didn't want to be doing was innovating on the fly uh when we're trying to connect up 3.6 million citizens yeah. I, want, I wanted something which were, i knew would work uh, and that was really quite simple not just so that we could share the gp record with a and e but actually so that as a region, we could learn how to do stuff, how to make things happen together. Because actually the biggest problem, and Margaret Anastar explains it very beautifully in her YouTube video, is the collective action dilemma, what sociologists call a collective action dilemma, where we all need to do something that's the same, but we need to step away from our own precious software or system in order to come together and that's the hard bit is persuading people actually that uh that you could do it another way rather than the way that you've been doing it so i'm not into, i'm not against new software obviously but yeah if you if you're doing a big regional or national project you don't want to craft it on the fly you you want something that you know is going to work i mean it's crazy we got we've got some stuff coming in so um john mcmahon's picking up on a few points migration of data now i'm going to sound old here but i've done it with paper records and um i would apply the same thing to paper records to looking at your old data because it always used to be should we scan these paper records or actually should we let them die for a couple of years and then get rid of them because we could scan them all and we might access 0.001% of them, but we've paid to scan them all. 
Um, and I think data is always that kind of question for me is, really, do we need everything? Or is this service going forward and can we still look up that data somewhere else, you know, with one click, which isn't really going to hamper anything? And um, the other point that a couple of people, Baskers and uh, John, have picked up there is um, uh, the number of devs on the big project, mate. I, I've been on a project um, at Bristol and there was um, 150 devs in a room trying to knock out this thing because we got so close. And it was just insanity, mate. You can't, you can't keep everyone on the same page. You get this thing this sprawl of development from different developers in different it's exactly it's yeah. exactly what ha exactly what happened the more devs we threw at it the worse it got the later okay. it got so um, go on carry on mate sorry well i mean fred fred brooks wrote um the mythical man month in the 70s but it's still true you know if you find yourself throwing extra devs at the software uh you, you're going to make it worse not better and you know, that was one of the fundamental errors that we made. Uh, and it was partly because we had so much money, we could throw devs at it. Um, uh, and, you know, when you've got billions to spend, it will find a way to get spent. It's it's easy to spend money quick, but whether it's delivering the value to the customer, I don't know. I'm just going to um, invite, uh, John's got his hand up, so I'm going to invite John to the stage. And um, we'll pick up the Q&A uh, after that. But John, if you want to uh, ask your question, if I haven't just um, ruined it all by <laughs> your previous points. <laughs> no, did, can you hear me OK? Yes, mate. OK, great. Um, I thought the presentation was excellent, Joseph. Um, I think that my observation, like, so I'm one of these real geeky people that connect systems rather than necessarily focuses on the nice pretty thing that users see although that's ultimately what i want right i think that for me like the focus on we're trying to build you know like things for people to be able to go and look at their patient portal or be able to go and share records i think that it's great that in the north you've been able to facilitate that by doing small nimble project but i guess for me it's like when, when I consider what is the optimum user journey, like what is the optimum outcome for a person, I don't want the council and the NHS and central gov to be disparate entities. In many ways, it's like, who's doing the job of creating a registry, like blockchain-based registry, which says, I'm happy to share my data with the council and central gov and the NHS, and by the way, I want to be able to control all of that in one place. And by by creating that innovative like layer, then you can have a seventeen year old building an amazing app that none of us could think of. Sorry, that's my daughter like laughing in the background. Um, but you know what I mean. She, she's going to build that app in the future, Joseph. But you know what I mean. It's like the focus to me should be how do you make sure you get all of that underpinning Lego so that people can build stuff on top of it rather than how can we build all of the apps in the first place without just thinking, let's just get the plumbing right. And if we get that right, innovation will happen. I mean, that's, that's exactly, I completely agree with that. That's exactly what we're trying to do here in the Northeast. So the patient engagement platform piece of work, which is uh, in development now, will allow a patient uh, both to log in with their NHS login. So we've borrowed that. Uh, one of our principles is to borrow shamelessly anything that works or looks like it might be expensive to develop. We uh -huh. borrow the NHS login uh, to so the, the patients can log into the, the Great North Care record, store their privacy settings like you would in any other walk of life. Yeah. You, know, you set the sliders where you want them. Not everybody wants to counsel to, to, to be able to see their record. Um, sure. I, you know, Some people do, some people don't, but there should be a button for that. So yeah. we're giving them a button for that. Also, when we set off, when we got we got a few quid out of George Osborne three general elections ago, because uh, he was talking about the Northern Powerhouse and nobody knew what he was going on about. Um, yeah. But we, he, he threw a few a, a bit of money at, uh, at digital uh, in the north. Uh, we took we, we took the opportunity. To, we, we, well, I phoned 
Um, the New York eHealth Collaborative, who have one of the largest shared record systems in the world with 8 million records, 8 million citizens in the New York eHealth Collaborative. And I rang Dave Whitlinger, the chief executive of, of the New York eHealth Collaborative, and he, and he, he answered the phone, amazingly. Um, and, and I asked him, Dave, you've been at this 10 years, what would you do differently? We're just about to start. And he said, I would have collected people's preferences around their willingness to be involved yeah. in research. And if I've done that, he said, um, I'd have the best research database in the world if I yeah. just asked permission. Um, so we're doing that. So we're, we're going to collect routinely people's preferences about their willingness to be involved in research. Um, largely because the coal and the ships have all gone here in the Northeast. We yeah. need to get really good at something else. Uh, um, uh, and maybe it could be we could produce the best research environment in the world just by making it really easy for the citizen to record their privacy settings. Yeah, uh, I mean, I, I just think that like the whole consent thing is so like, it's so fundamental that it has to almost be part of everything because I mean, I'm doing some like R&D on something. Um, I'm, a, I'm a product person, you know, I create products. Um, and one of those things is around, how do you create like an AI, which basically can do loads of smart stuff but can only do all of that smart stuff if they've given you permission to use their data to do that smart stuff. So a lot of that design is actually really around how do we make sure that we've got all of the right permission and promote consent as at every possible opportunity. So I think you're definitely doing the right thing, Joseph. So great, Thanks. thank you. Cheers, John. Um, I'm going to take my power to try and remove you. Oh, you've removed yourself. You spoiled that. <laughs> I needed to test that. Okay, mate, let's take some Q and A. Uh, this one makes me laugh. Um, I can't wait for your response. Has the government learned anything from the debacle? <laughs> um, I think the honest answer is no. I don't, I don't really think they have. Um, partly because, uh, you know, I'm on my 14th Secretary of State for Health that I've served under in my 30 year career. The average length of stay is about two years. A project like the electronification of the NHS is probably a 30 year project. Yeah. Um, uh, and you're only gonna have the same leader. And every time a new health minister comes in, you, you've got to educate them about this stuff. Uh, and you know, Matt Hancock is not everybody's uh, flavor of the month, but to be fair, he, he does know a little bit about IT and he has, in my opinion, been a bit better than some of his predecessors in this space. But um, the government as a whole, um, you know, the middle bit never changes. Doesn't matter how you vote or what happens in the general election, there's a layer um, of government which um, just tends to repeat the same problems, you know, overly centrally controlled budget, try and architect it from Westminster. We know that doesn't work. Listen to Margaret Anastat. Get the money out to the people who are doing the do on the ground and they will get it right. The only time we got this right actually was in general practice IT. They gave the money to the GPs so they were spending their own money on themselves when they bought systems. So they got value. Um, some of them developed systems, um, but they got value. Uh, and unfortunately, the national programme killed off an absolutely vibrant GP IT market by, uh, by going to central contracting. Whereas previously it had been quite a vibrant marketplace, but yeah, it, it's 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 hard to watch. But have the government learned anything? Not a lot. Brilliant, thank you. And um, by some serendipitous moment, it's been quite a week for these. But I can genuinely say you have uh, been nice about George Osborne. Not necessarily nice about him, but he gave you money. <laughs> he did. I, I now have a question from someone who is nice about um, Michael Gove in a previous life. And <laughs> those two tie together because allegedly in this reshuffle, Michael Gove may be the next health secretary. So question I have um, from Vasquez is, how did you overcome the politics and bureaucracy that comes with every project or programme? Um, well, the, the, the local politics 
was easier to do than national politics because um, we all knew each other. Uh, one of the one of the things that uh, I say about uh, um, an IT, a big information sharing project, is that if you uh, McDonald's law, if you like, if you can't all be in the same pub in an hour, your project's too big. Um, the geography of, that, that humans can cope with, the number of relationships that humans can cope with, is limited. And once you get above that human to human contact, so 12 trusts across the Northeast, I can get to know on an individual basis every um, medical director and every chief executive. It's doable on that scale. Go bigger than that. At the end of the day, an information sharing project is actually based on trust. And the, you know, the, the basic question at the bottom of any is, am I comfortable sharing this information with this organization? Really, you're asking yourself, am I comfortable sharing this information with Brian from South Shields? Because he's going to be managing it for them. And is he, is he a safe pair of hands? Do I know Brian well enough to share people's healthcare records? Uh, and it's that human scale. So you manage the politics locally. Uh, on a national level, it's, it's, it's much more difficult. Uh, and it's very hard for any government to completely um, be trusted. I mean, you, you know, you, you can't trust the government with some things um, you, because the, the government change. You, you talked a lot about stakeholder engagement. And for me, it's stakeholder engagement and the next step, which is buy into the outcomes. And if you get that, which you kind of can't get on a national scale if you get that with a project you get, you're gonna go far aren't you yeah yeah i think uh, you know uh, if the project's if it's a project's really big what you've got to do is you've got to hand the money out into small enough areas that people can know that brian is trustworthy uh, and the, it's the it's a goer so you can do a national project but it must be done by a, a federated uh, approach rather than if you try and architect it from Westminster, it always, always ends the same way. It's more directly accountable for outcomes as well, isn't it? Because how, how do you manage a national scale project in terms of what's made the difference here? I don't know, because 2000 devs just committed changes at the same time. So what was good, what was bad, I don't know. Um, so Basca's second question, and I feel like um, otherwise she's, probably going to kill me uh, in no way is she saying Michael Gove would have been brilliant for everything so that's no way hanging a hat on anything like that but if you could change one thing about the big project what it, would it be uh, about the national program I would have um been I would have had it <laughs> to be to be to be absolutely fair I mean there are bits of the national program which have laid down some foundations which we can build upon so the adoption of the nhs number the fact that we have a single identifier for patients if you go to america researchers would kill for that you know that they're, they're, they're trying to find out the ultimate outcome health outcome in terms of death and they're, they're doing that by trying to find out which facebook's account have gone dark you know they have no national unique identifier in their health system so that's that's a blessing what well, one thing would I have changed? I just would have made it less natural, nas uh, national. I would have regionalized uh, the budgets and put in strong leadership teams at a local level rather than try and architect it all from, from Westminster. Brilliant. Um, so next question, uh, we've got two more questions and then we should probably wrap it up because I think it's time to open a, a glass of a refreshment or it is for me um so we can move to networking so um from carl who was absolutely in awe of that budget and was lining up his retirement if he gets on a project like that which he's lying anyway because i know he wouldn't do that but will great north care be able to use the facilities of 5g straight to paramedics mobile phones for example in due course yeah um the the, the adoption of new technology is obviously always a bit slow and a bit dependent on the cash uh, in, in the NHS. But yeah, there's absolutely no reason why we can't do that. I was going to say, you're, you're probably, I don't know, I, I don't know an area where you could go coverage is fine. 
I know London authorities were working on coverage, you know, mobile phone coverage, they were having problems and things like that. So it's, to, it's hard to, to build on. To be honest, we've, we've pretty much, we've made it so it'll run over the connectivity of wet string. Um, <laughs> so we, you know, we, because we, we know that the NHS and also that the patients don't all have the best kit. So we try and make sure that we're using up as little bandwidth as we can uh, and and make sure that uh, you know your scabby wet string 3G connection uh, should be good enough to get you on. Brilliant, yeah, I like that. So it might even work in Torquay down here, mate. <laughs> um, so and Andreas um, said thanks for the we borrow everything a huge success factor if well analysed, in my humble opinion. So just a statement. So um, unless anyone, I'm just seeing the feed going on. Uh, wet strain <laughs> should work in Tom and Tool. Um, OK, so thank you, Joe. That's been brilliant. Um, if anyone wants to do a session, get in touch. Um, I'm Lean and Agile on Twitter. Uh, I will put some stuff in the chat. Um, if you could use the emojis, I'd love to see what happens with emojis if every, anyone's around. Can you, can you, oh, there we go. There's a thumbs up, thumbs up, thumbs up. Oh, loving it. Oh, I like that. I like that. That's nice. A little bit of love for Joe. Um, massive thanks, mate. Uh, number four, you've done. Uh, we'll record the video. Of, uh, the video's recorded. We'll edit it. It will go on YouTube. It'll be part of um all of the sessions that are going to be available um anyone interested in speaking come come and chat to me I, i'll be in the lounge i just need to check the dog a second um i'm going to try out the speed networking if you're still around please do stop around try the lounge try the speed networking joe thank you very much um for giving up yet another friday to come to improve camp that was a, a brilliant session. I'm with Carl. I I dream of those numbers, but actually they would have given me massive nightmares had had I been involved. And I would have I would have ended up the same way as you, I think, not on the project for too long. Um, but thank you. Um, until next week, uh, where we will have another session, same deal, short lightning talk, QA, and then networking. Join us in the lounge, um, give us your feedback, uh, and thank you for being here. And I'm going to try and end the session now. I don't know what that means, but I'll try it.